Is there anyone out there that still doesn't understand what tokens do to your PS3? Okay, last time. This is a capacitor. This is a PS3. This is the capacitor in your PS3. Any questions? Uh, yeah, what are you even talking about? I'm talking about what killed your PS3. Bad soldering, the GPU... Nope. It was the ticking time bomb sitting silently in your motherboard for the last 15 years. I still can't believe that when I need to make a circuit, I can open KiCad for free, prototype a printed circuit board, order it pre-assembled, and have it shipped to me in about a week. I would have thought this cost thousands, but it doesn't, thanks to the sponsor of this video, JLCPCB. Their prices are super affordable, perfect for a do-it-yourself hobbyist like me. When you need some 3D printed cell bracers for your PS3, or pre-populated tantalizers to fix bad NEC tokens, they got you covered. When I need more tantalizers, I order them by simply uploading the Gerbers, selecting 0.8 millimeter thick PCB so they'll fit right. Are you tired of hand assembling them? Simply choose the option for PCB assembly. Upload the bill of materials and position file, then confirm the parts. Here's a tip. Shop around for the best price on caps here. Once everything looks good, add them to your cart and place the order. JLC PCB's engineers will take it from there and correct a lot of issues for you. Quality is excellent, and they do a flying probe electrical test to ensure every part is soldered correctly. They offer a variety of shipping options. I always choose the cheapest one, and I've still gotten it delivered in less than a week. So if you need any PCBs for your next project, I can honestly recommend you consider JLC PCB. Not because they're sponsoring the channel, but because I've personally used their services with fantastic results. And I must say, they do a beautiful job. Now, back to the video. The NEC token capacitors are known to go bad and often cause the yellow light of death. You may have seen some of my other videos where I beta test a custom PCB I designed to replace them. In this video, I'm releasing it to the public. Let's back up. The yellow light of death is what you see when a PlayStation 3 encounters a general hardware fault. There's a disc in here too. Could be a blown fuse, dead power supply, or a fried huh. GPU. I got a free Japanese disc. Oh, before it uh, yellow lighted. But in this video, I'm focusing on another main culprit bad capacitors. In 2019, a user named Naked Snake posted a tutorial on the PSX Place showing how to replace the NEC token capacitors. It blew up because it suggested maybe the real issue wasn't the RSX GPU after all. Caps are a lot easier to replace than the BGA mounted GPU, so this seemed like a godsend. But that's the rub. People assumed it applied to every PS3 model. It doesn't. Here's what the stats show is really causing it. If you have an A, B, C, E, G, H, M, or Q model PS3, then it has a defective GPU. That's the problem, not the caps. But if you've got a J, K, L, P, or 20XX model, these don't have the flawed RSX. Those consoles, the tokens are the problem. Now they can die in both, but the defective 90 nanometer RSX usually dies first. Naked Snake was right, just not universally. And that misunderstanding set the stage for what I call the Great Token Massacre of 2020. We're talking about soldering disasters. Burnt boards, caps flying off like popcorn, entire consoles being misdiagnosed and whacked like Hoffa. People slap tantalums on every PS3 hoping to win the lottery and flip an expensive model for bank. But it's way harder than it looks. The PS3's thick internal ground and power planes make soldering a nightmare, even if you're skilled. Sometimes the soldering job was bad, sometimes it wasn't the caps. Sometimes it seemed to work initially, then failed again. They assumed it was bad soldering, soldered again, and again, but it was a red herring, chasing the rabbit down to the bad place, not the fix. A bad GPU was trolling them the whole time. I say they, you dare Felix, but it happened to me too. There needs to be an easier method. It was frustrating enough to make me find a better way to diagnose and fix the yellow light of death. But this was before we had access to Syscon error codes to help us tell the difference between RSX failures and capacitor faults. Back then, the yellow light of death was a plague and we were all guessing. 
the Dark Ages of Repair. So, how do you replace the NEC tokens? Well, I have my own method. Other people have their methods. And uh, I have been learning from other people's methods and I have adopted Squeeps. I like his ancient hieroglyphic carving technique. And I'll show you what I mean in just a second. I can find my chisel. Oh, here it is. All right, so here's my chisel. And here's my uh, hammer. First thing I need to do is place the board on a flat surface. If I place it like this and I press down, it's gonna flex the board. And I don't wanna do that because it could break the BGA. All right, sturdy box. If I place that under the area, then while I'm working on the NEC tokens, all right, it doesn't flex. So I should be able to just lay it down there and then with the jeweler's hammer, tap it in. Before I take you through the design process, we need to understand what we're trying to replace. <laughs> Let's get this out of the way. Prodlizer is a ridiculous name. Sounds like a marketing gimmick. It stands for Prompt Broadband Stabilizer. They wanted a name that would convey the idea that it's not just a capacitor. But here's the twist. It's not just a gimmick. It's a very specific kind of capacitor. On PS3 motherboards, you'll see two types. NEC token protolyzers and Nippon Chemicon protolyzers. Same function, different branding. We'll just call them tokens because NEC tokens was more common, but both brands fail in the same way. Now, here's the important part. A protolyzer isn't just a bulk capacitor. It's a broadband power decoupling device. That means it smooths voltage across a wide range of frequencies, far more effective than a typical capacitor. Most people think of capacitors as little energy reservoirs, tiny fast batteries. That's their first main job, filling in voltage dips between power pulses. In the PS3, the RSX GPU is fed by two buck converters, switching at 500 kilohertz in a bang bang pattern, delivering a pulse every millionth of a second. That creates ripple. Too much ripple, and the RSX crashes. If voltage dips more than 163 millivolts or spikes more than 100 millivolts, the buck controller flags it, and the system controller shuts everything down. That's your 1002 syscon error. A death sentence if power isn't clean. Bulk filtering capacitors charge during these pulses and discharge between them, smoothing out the voltage to keep it safe for the processor. That's the primary purpose. The second job of a capacitor is less well known, but just as important, suppressing high frequency noise. When high speed circuits switch on and off, they generate RF noise, interference. Capacitors short that noise to ground by providing a low impedance path, preventing instability and weird glitches. The tokens did both jobs extremely well. That's the thing. They're not just average caps. They had a broader frequency response than traditional tantalum, aluminum, or ceramic options. How good were they? Just take a look at this frequency response curve from their promotional documentation. It takes an array of four traditional capacitors to even approximate a single protolyzer. That's fewer parts, less board space, and lower cost. Sony didn't just pick these for fun. They were efficient, compact, and cost-effective. At scale, that matters. So why did the industry abandon them? Well, that's the question, isn't it? The common assumption is they must have been defective. But is that actually true? Let's break it down. These caps don't fail right away. Some die after thousands of hours of use. Others fail sitting in storage, sealed in their original boxes. That's not a usage issue. That's a time-based failure. That is suspicious. If it were a bad batch, we'd have known within a year of launch. The tokens didn't start dying in large numbers until nearly a decade later. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, I know there was an issue with the yellow light of death after launch. Simmer down. I've already linked the cause to the RSX. It has the bump gate material set like the 360 MacBook Pro and Nvidia chipsets. That's a separate issue and not the focus of this video. Would you like to know more? Tokens didn't start dying en masse until many years later. That suggests this isn't a factory defect. It's a materials issue. In other words, the tokens are a ticking time bomb. Why? According to NEC's own technical documents, a protolyzer is a hybrid aluminum electrolytic cap with a multi-layer structure. Quote, We etched both sides of aluminum foil, formed dielectric films chemically, 
then deposited conductive polymer layers, followed by graphite and silver paste layers. End quote. Wait, silver paste? That's interesting. Silver is conductive, yes, but it's also chemically reactive. It oxidizes over time in the presence of air, heat, and humidity. That means the electrical characteristics can drift, degrade, or become unstable without any visible damage over time. People have noticed some tokens look burnt and speculated that might mean they're bad. But we've seen some like that that still work fine. Others look perfect and are dead as a dinosaur. That makes them unpredictable. You can't trust visual inspection. We've noticed that they tend to die within months to a year after rework heat. Text making Frankies have had some consoles come back for warranty repair with bad tokens and have started replacing them just to remove the inconvenience of having to get it repaired twice. My buddy Squeeped wanted some bad tokens for testing, so he took new old stock protolyzers and baked them at 120 degrees Celsius for one month. The result? Instant yellow light of death console wouldn't even boot. They didn't short out, they just silently failed. So think about that. If it only takes a month at 120 degrees Celsius to kill them, how long does it take in a hot attic or on a fireplace mantle or outside in a shed for years? Your PS3 might never have been turned on and it could still die. That would suck. Buying a sealed PS3 and when you finally unbox it and turn it on, beep, 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 that is why they're a ticking time bomb. Let's assume there was a good reason the industry stopped using protolyzers and it's a good idea to replace them. How do I match their performance? You can't just throw on some random tantalums and call it a day. If you're not trying to match the token's frequency response, you're not replacing it. You're compromising. The number one spec that matters in this context is ESR, equivalent series resistance. Low ESR is crucial, especially at high frequencies. It determines how efficiently a capacitor can respond to ripple and transients. Higher ESR equals more ripple current, more heat, shorter lifespan. That's why tokens were so good. They had excellent broadband suppression and low ESR. But if you're replacing them with something that has a higher ESR at high frequencies, you're not fixing the problem, you're just delaying it. I knew I couldn't rely just on polymer caps. They drop off too fast at higher frequencies. So I used Comet's KSIM simulation tool to model a combined array, carefully tuning it for wideband suppression. The final design uses an MLCC stack of 47 microfarad, 22, 10, 4.7, 2.2, and 1 microfarad multi-layer ceramic capacitors. You can see how their curves push down the impedance at higher frequencies than the tantalum polymer cap alone does. The combined frequency response is now a broad band that better approximates what we lost by removing tokens. But wait a minute, so why do some people just use tantalums? People say tantalums replaced them for a reason, but did they really? Yes, polymer caps are more common now, but that doesn't mean they're functionally equivalent. Without supplemental high frequency filtering, they may work, but for how long? If your goal is longevity, not just a temporary fix, then relying on polymer caps alone is cutting a corner. That's why I include the MLCC array. Let's look at how Sony approached this exact problem in the PS3 Slims. If you pop open a Slim and look at its motherboard, guess what you'll see? Polymer caps, sure, but also 22 microfarad MLCCs. And tucked away inside the cell's, uh, hole are 10 microfarad ceramics. Sony themselves used a hybrid strategy, polymer plus MLCCs, to replace the tokens. Let's simulate their configuration and compare it to mine. Is it as flat? Not quite. But it still pushes down the impedance across the needed spectrum. A clearly engineered solution, not just slapped together. So no, you don't have to use my array. You could use Sony's. I just prefer mine. What I don't know yet. I haven't been able to fully characterize my replacement under dynamic load at least not with high-end lab tools. To do that properly, I need a network analyzer and an arbitrary waveform generator, gear I don't currently have. On the oscilloscope, they look great. Install results have been stable, but for full quantification, we'd need someone in the community with the right equipment to step in. So, do they work? Yes. Over the past two years, I've shared the open beta with the community, and they have shipped hundreds, possibly thousands of consoles with tantalizers or similar boards. And the reports are back. Overwhelmingly positive. 
Do I know if every single one is still running perfectly today? No, people don't always report back. But I can tell you this, they've worked on every console I've personally installed them in. My friends are using them with only one dying because of a defective MLCC. He swapped that out and it fired up no problem. I haven't had to rework a single one when installed on a properly diagnosed token failure. That's a strong signal that they're not just a quick fix. It's been long enough that I'm reasonably sure they're a long-term drop in replacement for the tokens. So that brings us to today. After two years of beta testing, real world use, feedback and design iteration, I'm officially releasing the PS3 Tantalizer version 1.0 to the public. You'll find everything you need linked in the description. KeyCAD project files, Gerber's, build materials, pick and place position file, assembly ready and open source. Use the board house of your choice or order them pre-assembled if you're tired of hand soldering caps. I designed this to be accessible to the community, not just fix your PS3 today, but to keep these consoles alive for years to come. The NEC tokens were cool, but flawed. They age poorly and they can fail without warning, turning your working console into a paperweight overnight. And the worst part, it doesn't even matter how often you used it. That PS3 in the closet, sealed in the box, still might have yellow light of death the second you turn it on. Because this isn't just about use, it's about time. That's why I made the tantalizer. Not as a workaround, not as a guess, but as an engineered replacement that matches what the protalyzers actually did. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It's comforting to think electronics aren't like the cabbage rotting in the back of your fridge, that you can forget about it and expect it to be as good as it was when you stored it. But that's a mental crutch. The sooner you realize and accept this fact, the sooner you can stop worrying about the inevitable and just enjoy your console while it lasts. I give the same advice to those afraid to use their yellow light of death prone fat models who think that by not playing them, that'll preserve them. It won't. I can't do storage again. I just can't. Jesse, Jesse. I will go back in the dark. What's the matter? What's wrong with her? Well, we've been in storage for a long time, waiting for you. So, if you've got a ticking time bomb in your closet, you now have the tools to defuse it. With that, I think this video has dragged on long enough. Thanks to everyone who tested, gave feedback, and helped get this project where it is. Grab the files, build your boards, and keep those PS3s running. For those here just to watch, thank you.